Good evening and welcome to Discover the Joy Bible Study. We're just glad that you've given us an opportunity to come into your home. And uh, as for you first time viewers, we study the Word of God verse by verse. We're in the book of Luke. So I would like for you to get your Bibles. And for those of you who may follow each week, we're in chapter 19 of Luke. And perhaps somebody's watching tonight and they don't have a Bible. That's part of our ministry uh, is to send out free Bibles. And you'll see at the bottom of the screen or the top of the screen, there'll be a phone number. And you can call the number and give us your information and we will send you a Bible. Uh, nothing is more important than the Word of God. It is God-ordained. It's God-inspired, and it's God's message to us as individuals. And also, we're just more than glad to pray with you. And so you can also call that same number, and someone will answer the phone, and we will be glad to pray with you, also put you on our prayer list. You know, we live in a day and age where all of us, uh, from day to day, almost from moment to moment, Things can change, you know, and there can be struggles in our life. It can be financial. It can be uh, relationships, uh, j job problems. The, the list can just go on and on. And uh, we can run everywhere else. We can worry ourselves to death about it. But the answer is taking those problems, those uh, problems that seem that there is no answer. You've tried everything else. And what we should do first is go to the Lord and cry out to Him and spread it before Him and allow Him and His great power to work in our midst and for Him to take care of the things that's really totally impossible for us to do on our own. Okay, tonight before we start, I would, uh, I'd like to go to the Lord in prayer. I was talking about how important prayer is, and I definitely believe that. Father, we just come into the throne room of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, God Almighty. Father, you are <coughs> the beginning, you're the end, you're the alpha, you're the omega, you're everything in between. And Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you reveal yourself to us through your word. You reveal your love, your mercy, your grace. Father, you reveal the plan that you've had for mankind. And even when, as human beings, we've messed it up, the original plan, Father, you had love enough for us that you sent Jesus Christ. He came and he paid a sin debt that we could not pay for ourselves. And because of that, if we accept what he did for us at Calvary, we have the blessed assurance of eternal life. And money cannot buy it, works cannot buy it, but Father, it's been bought and paid for by the precious blood of Jesus. Father, tonight as we study, I pray that you open our ears, touch our hearts, and Father, that you will change us from the inside out. Thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Okay, beginning tonight in chapter 19, uh, we finished up with uh, the section ending with verse 27. So tonight we begin with verse 28, and we're going to see Jesus' ministry in Jerusalem. And after G Jesus had said this, which he had been giving the parable, uh, he had just finished giving the parable as he was going into Jericho, uh, where we finished last week, of the servants, and he gave them the pounds and how that they were to use that. And uh, some of them did, but one didn't. He buried his, and he was proud to hand his back to the, uh, to the master, and the master said, <laughs> That's not what I expected. I wanted you to take it and use it, let it m multiply it. And the message from that was that we, as followers of Jesus Christ, that whatever he's gifted us with, one thing we all have, if you've been saved, you have the ability to tell someone else that 
Jesus Christ has saved you. You may not be a Bible scholar. I'm not a Bible scholar. But the more we study, the more God reveals his word to us. But we can all at least testify that Jesus Christ has the power to save. And uh, <clears throat> that's how he grows his kingdom. And that was the message that he was using when he gave the parable of the servants and what they did with what the master had given them. The master, the master has given us uh, treasures, treasures here in his word. The greatest treasure is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I think I mentioned this last week. Have you ever stopped and thought, if you're saved, that God is using you as a, as, a, as a home, an indwelling, a dwelling as the Holy Spirit is within us. That's awesome that God is in me. And if you're saved, God is in you through the Holy Spirit. And um, <clears throat> if you've not been saved, oh friend, I pray tonight that you will listen. And as the Holy Spirit draws you, that you would just drop your head and commit to Jesus Christ. All you have to do is say, Jesus, Lord, I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. I believe that Jesus died for me at Calvary and accept him. And if you do that tonight, we would love for you to call us. We want to rejoice with you. Okay, so now we, say, we read in verse 28, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. This is his last ministry as he's going to Jerusalem before he goes to Calvary. And it says, as he approached Bethage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, tell him the Lord needs it. Well, you might be thinking or might be asking yourself the question, why did Jesus choose to enter Jerusalem uh, as he did? Well, during his ministry, he had pretty much uh, tried to avoid calling a lot of attention to himself, although there was great crowds the more miracles he performed, the more he taught, the more he preached, the crowds followed him from place to place. And as he's going up into Jerusalem right at this time, that he has not only the 12 apostles or disciples with him, but there was other people who were, who were traveling with him, staying, staying with him. See, he chose this particular time to enter Jerusalem. And once he enters Jerusalem at this time, he will not leave Jerusalem until after the resurrection. It was a special season for the Jewish people. And it was called the Passover season. So the, Jew, the Jewish people who lived in other towns and outlying areas around the city of Jerusalem during the Passover would come into Jerusalem so that they could sacrifice the, the lambs uh, that, was, that was observed by all the Jewish people. And of course, what they didn't realize is that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world. He was willing in ages past when God the Father, God the Son, and the God, God the Holy Spirit at some point had a council meeting and said mankind is going to need to be redeemed and it has to be a perfect sacrifice and Jesus said I'm willing and he had he was willing and the blood of Jesus is still as powerful today as it was the day it was shed I was listening to someone the other day so few churches, pastors, preachers anymore even preach about the blood of Jesus and without the shed blood of Jesus there is no redemption 
of sin. See, God can take a black heart, a heart that is just blackened with sin. And that's how mine was, how yours is if you've never been saved. If you have been saved at one time, how your heart was, it was black. But when it's been washed in the blood of Jesus, the word tells us that it becomes white as snow. And then when Jesus sees us, when God sees us, God the Father sees us, he no longer sees us in this old body, this old house that we live in where we still struggle with the flesh, but he sees us through the righteousness of Jesus Christ that has washed us and made us clean before a holy God. So the lamb, the holy lamb, the perfect lamb, Jesus Christ, was also traveling into Jerusalem. As the pilgrims were traveling into Jerusalem, many of them carried their own lambs. They were supposed to bring the best of the flock for it to be sacrificed, for it to be offered, and others would buy theirs at the temple. But it was the time of the Passover, the sacrifice for sins. But after this, there was no need any longer after Jesus died at Calvary for another lamb, a, an animal to have to be sacrificed because the perfect sacrifice was made when Jesus Christ died and it was made for every man, every woman, every boy, every girl that would ever live. And so you may wonder, well, why now was he, did, did, was, did he go into the city as, as, he's, as he's doing? He's told these disciples to go on ahead and to get this coat. Actually, he was fulfilling prophecy. See, the Old Testament was full of prophecy that God would send the, a Messiah to his people to free them, to free them from sin. But they misunderstood. They thought they would be freed from the Roman government that was ruling over them from the bondage of the, of the rule of the Romans. But God said, no, I'm going to free you. I'm going to set you free. You will never, ever be more free than the day that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And that applies to us today. But he fulfills scripture. Uh, if you've got your Bible and you want to turn, if not, why don't you jot it down to Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 and 10. Verse 9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a coat, the foal of a donkey. That was back in Zechariah. And now, many years have passed, even a couple of hundred or more has passed, and now Jesus Christ is fulfilling exactly what the prophet Zechariah had prophesied. And that's the reason he told those disciples to go get that cult, because he was fulfilling uh, <coughs> prophecy. Jesus Christ fulfilled every prophecy that was about him in the Old Testament. There are still some prophecies in the Old Testament speaking about uh, the end of time that's coming, the tribulation, and they still are to be fulfilled. But I'm telling you, they were, they're being fulfilled now. Some theologians say that actually prophecy is being fulfilled so fast they cannot even keep up with it. And all you have to do is look around and prophecy is being fulfilled right and left. In fact, I heard the other night I was listening to a broadcast, and the, what I was, the show I was listening to uh, is not a religious show. In fact, it, it, it's a news show. But what the, <clears throat> what the gentleman said is so true. He said, what's going on in America today it's not just the Democratic Party. It's not just the Republican Party. It's not even just the White House. 
what is going on in America today is an evil source, an evil power that's taking over. And that's exactly right because as the days grow darker, as the days getting closer and closer and closer to the coming of Jesus Christ, the <clears throat> world becomes darker and darker in sin because what we've done, we've turned our eyes, we've turned our hearts away from God. And you say, well, not everybody. There's still some Christians. Yes, there will always be some who are willing to take a stand, but we also know that it rains on the just and the unjust. And the more we push God back, the more he withdraws his hand of protection that we as a country have always enjoyed having because we were founded on Christian principles. Christian, wake up, look out, watch, and work on because Jesus Christ's coming is nearer than, with, than you might think. And that verse, number, uh, verse 9 of Zechariah the ninth chapter is speaking of Jesus' first coming when he comes as Savior to save us and to bring redemption. In fact, it said, he comes to you righteous and having salvation. But verse 10 of Zechariah chapter 9 is going to speak of his second coming. Let's read it. Uh, it says in verse 10, We'll take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Okay, verse 9 of Zechariah was the fulfillment of the triumphant uh, entering of Jerusalem by Jesus Christ. Verse 10 is speaking of his second coming and when you look at those two verses uh, and they're you know uh, one right after the other they seem to be close and I like the illustration that I heard years ago. If you look in the distance at the mountains you know there are two mountains may look if you're if you're 20 miles, 10 miles, 100 miles away, 50 miles, <clears throat> those mountains can look really close together. They can look like they're almost touching. But as you get closer and closer and closer to the mountains, you see that actually there's two mountains and that there's a great distance between them. <clears throat> That's between verse 9 and 10 of Zechariah 9. There's a great distance. The first coming of Jesus Christ uh, is foretold in chapter in verse 9 and the second coming of Jesus Christ is uh, foretold in verse 10. You know and Jesus Christ someday soon after the tribulation and he comes back he will set up an earthly throne for a thousand years and in Philippians 2 9 and 10 it says that Every nation, every person, it says every tongue will confess that he is Lord. See, he's Lord whether I say it or whether you say it, whether you acknowledge it or not. Jesus Christ is Lord. <clears throat> we were in a discussion the other night on some biblical things, and um, it's what we were at, the, there's questions that were coming up about different segments of scripture and what people thought about this and what they thought about something else. Did you know it really doesn't matter what other questions any of us have until you settle the question of all questions and that is, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Until you settle that, it's not really going to matter. It's not going to matter whether you believe that, that God is the creator of all, that, uh, that from the beginning of the book in Genesis that he spoke and the creation, this world came to be. That's not really going to matter what you think about that. If you have not settle the question within your own heart 
that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he came to this world to die and to redeem you from your sins. What will your answer be or what has your answer been to the question of the ages? And that is, who is Jesus to you? Well, <clears throat> in verse 32 back in Luke 19, those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he told told them, and that's talking about the colt that had never been ridden, and it was fulfillment of prophecy. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? I mean, this day and age, if somebody was taking your bicycle or your car or your horse or your coat, whatever, you'd probably be more than, why are you doing that? It's like, well, what's up with this? And they replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, and apparently the owner was already prepared by God Almighty because they were glad for them to take the colt. And it says they brought it to Jesus, and then as, he begins, as they began to enter the city of Jerusalem, they threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. And he went along, and the people spread their cloaks on the road for him to, uh, for the cult to uh, actually step on the, the cloaks. They were treating him as king, and that's exactly who he is. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And it says in verse 37, when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. You know, I mentioned earlier that <clears throat> this was a time of celebration for the Jewish people. People came from everywhere to, to come to observe the Passover in the city of Jerusalem. Now, not only was Jesus coming into Jerusalem, riding on the colt, just as... Uh, prophet had said he would, but there was the 12 with him, the 12 men that would help spread the message of Jesus Christ, all except the one, which was uh, Judas. But there was also the other people that had just been drawn to Jesus, and they followed him too. But at this point, I think excitement had spread, and the news had spread, and many of these People inside the city had heard, oh, the man called Jesus, the miracle worker. He's coming into town. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they go out also to meet him. So there's a great joyous crowd at this time. And it says they began to joyfully praise God in loud voices. And in verse 38, it says, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord and peace in heaven, and glory in the highest. Well, you know, the Pharisees, they also always followed Jesus around. They were uh, a thorn in his side because a Phar the Pharisees were religious leaders who their religion was nothing but the old law and trying to catch someone else in breaking that law. They were hypocrites. They pretended to be something that they were not. And <clears throat> Jesus knew that. But they were always there, seemed to be just needling. So what they say in verse 39 is, uh, <clears throat> some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. That's very important that we really look at that verse. See, in verse 38, the crowd in loud voices, and it was almost like a sing song. They were saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. See, <clears throat> they were acknowledging the fact that Jesus truly was the Messiah. They're longed for Messiah. They're longed for King. 
And uh, whether some of them realized it totally or not, they still were acknowledging it. And they were saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. But the Pharisees, they write immediately. They're saying, uh, no, he's not king. So they call him teacher. See, they're not going to acknowledge. They were so blinded because they chose to be blinded that they did not see him as the promised Messiah. It didn't matter how many, how many people could make the deaf hear, could bring sight to the blind, could make the lame walk. I can't. You can't. I can't walk on water. Can you? No. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who holds all power within this entire universe, could do all of that, and yet they chose to be blinded by their own uh, hypocrisy and not acknowledge that he was king. And so <clears throat> when, he call, when they call him teacher, that, that's what they're saying. We don't believe you're king. But what Jesus says when he replies in verse 40, he says, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. What he's saying is, you know what? If the people don't acknowledge my kingship because of who I am, I can even make, and my father, God the Father, can make the very stones and the rocks cry out. Hosanna to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. See, Jesus' kingship is reality. It's a fact. Whether I acknowledge it or whether you acknowledge it, it doesn't change the fact that Jesus Christ is king and he's going to be our soon coming king and we better be prepared. The first time he came as savior, the next time, friend, he will be coming as judge. But we have an opportunity right now to make it right, to get it right. And it says, as he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it. In fact, in Luke 13, 34, when we studied that, he, he talked about Jerusalem. Oh, if as a hen gathers her chicks and protects them. Sinful mankind breaks the heart of holy God. And we need to understand that. It broke his heart to the fact that he was willing to pay the price that we could not pay for ourselves. And then he goes on to say, <clears throat> if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. See what they didn't realize? That very day, the Prince of Peace was right before them. See. There's turmoil in this world. I mean, on every hand, things are, 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 get, are being, uh, we're being shaken up pretty good. The tornado that hit Oklahoma, from the first warning sound, they had 16 minutes. Are you ready when Jesus comes? Mm -hmm.